And we are here to talk to Richard Clapton about the, what, the 150th anniversary of the first album, is it, Richard? No, no, but <laughs> there's a great photo put of Dale Braithwaite and me. It was on um, last year on Daydream Island. We were both there to do a gig. And we're out in the back, back of one of those great boats they have in the Witch Sundays. And um, everyone was yahooing about my birthday. And Daryl said to me, I was on the back back of one of those great boats in the Witch Sundays with Daryl and people yah- yahooing around and going on about Ralph's birthday. And Daryl said to me, so, gee, you've been around a long while now. How many years is it? And I, I quite honestly, I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest. And then I went, Gee, Prussian Blue is 1973, and now it's going to be 2023 next year. Anyway, so I said to Daryl, Daryl said you should do a tour. And I said, no, 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 no. Daryl, I know you've been around for 50 years, so let's do a 100th anniversary tour. <laughs> he cracked up laughing, so did I, and some clever person was on the ball enough to get the snap, and it's just a great photo of Daryl and I just collapsing in laughter. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Well, that, you, you're right. Uh, Sherbert was not at '69, I think, for their first record. So, was it? Yeah. Old man. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were the new kid on the block, by the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Daryl didn't point that out, did he? No, he did not. He told me 50 years. Yeah. Pants <laughs> yeah. on well, fire. <laughs> well, the 50th, 50th anniversary is of this album, the Prussian Red. Blue album. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like when this album came out, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a smash hit, was it, for you? No. It happened a few years no. later. Um, because the, the first two or three years of my career in Australia were were, were quite odd, really. But look, I've got to abbreviate this because, and, and Paul, I know you've heard this story 20 times. You're like my band. Yeah, Ralph, we've heard that one <laughs> 10 times. But you're going to hear it again, Paul, okay? So, um, you know, I started out in bands in London, um, got deported from the UK because the American band that I put together were um, importing pots in little film can- canisters into um, into the UK. And I'd already made friends in Berlin um, over the years that I'd been living in London. So I headed back there because I knew people there. That was the reason I went to Berlin. And then I was in bands in Berlin, and we really believed we had a big shot with a company called Kinney. And do you know what Kinney was, Paul? No. This is a test. Kinney was the original Warners. Kinney, um, that would have been 1969, 1970, and Warners in those days was called Kinney, and it evolved into, into Warners. Anyway, we had a really good shot. And we were just hippie bums and we're driving down from um, uh, Berlin to Munich and we invested a lot of money that we didn't have. We borrowed money to buy really, you know, Marshall lamps and stuff like that. And then um, uh, an American band who were called Sop With Camel noticed that we were called Sop With Camel and their legal department, Universal Records legal department wrote us a letter, like a cease and desist or we'll run you out of the business um and regrettably um the record company in munich got cold feet because they thought you know you know this could be in trouble and so they didn't go ahead with the deal which was pretty shattering but in the interim um i had a, um, a bavarian friend georgie who was like cute as <laughs> georgie was he was like a little you'd imagine a little bavarian he georgie um married yabina yabina Mercedes Balson, which means she had married into the Mercedes family and the Balson Biscuits family. Wow. So George was just a humble farm boy from Bavaria who, you know, um, married Sabina. And they had a they had a, a beautiful house on the outskirts of Berlin. And they had decided to relocate to New York because Sabina wanted to study at New York University. So Sabina and Georgie said, well, we're not using the house, just move in there. I did not have a fennec to my name. I mean, I used to ride the trains for that paying and stuff like that. Um, so I was in that house for uh, many months, seven or eight months probably, and I began to write, I think, the first songs I wrote. Oh, the first song I wrote was was about when I got booted out of the UK and I ended up in, in a train carriage um, with an, an Austrian girl. I prefer to call her the Austrian princess. And anyway, she was headed back to uh, Vienna. Uh, I didn't know where I was going. 
and hence the song Last Train to Marseille, which is probably the first serious song I ever wrote. And because um, it was, it was the last train to Marseille. Mm. And from there on, you know, I was writing songs like Southern Germany. And I wrote, um, I can't count them. You probably have a better idea than I do, Paul, how many German songs are on that album. But it's for, isn't it? It's virtually 50 50. It's like, you know, it's yeah. like one of those ice creams they used to have, triple treat or whatever. <laughs> well, so, I, guess, I, want to be, I want to be a survivor would be one of those tracks then, would it? In, in Germany? No. Yeah. I'm, I want to be a survivor is a King's Cross Sydney song. Uh-huh. Because I was living in a rat infested dump in King's Cross, looking out over the beautiful harbour and watching the cockroaches crawl up the walls. <laughs> so sorry to shatter shatter your illusion there. Oh, okay. But- well, I guess that's got more in common with Strange Days in Chippendale then. Well, yes, because um there was a so I immediately latched into the into the folky scene because I've been in the folky scene in Berlin and Munich. And um, there were really great folk clubs in Sydney in those days, in, in um, 73, 74. So I started doing the rounds with them. And I honestly, I didn't have a penny to my name. Um, as you can see from the photos, I had hair down to my ass. Nobody was going to give me a job. And so I um, um, accepted an invitation from one of the other folky guys to move into his place, crash out at his place in Chippendale, uh, which to your um, uh, Vic, fellow Victorians, Chippendale is Redfern. <laughs> okay, Look, quick geography lesson there. Um, and, not, so I mean, and, and for our American friends, not the nightclub. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, uh, oh God, Paul, getting elderly. You know, don't, don't. No, no, no. I'm not. It's brain fog. It's COVID brain fog. Okay, don't, don't. Don't correct me. I know where I was at. I was coming. I came straight from southern Germany, straight into crashing out in a pad in Chippendale. So the, the Brush and Blue album, it's like it's not a transition. It's like back to back. You know, southern Germany to Redfern, just like that. <laughs> um. So this the 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 entire album is like fifty fifty. It's fifty fifty very German, and the other fifty percent very Australian, or if you prefer, very Sydney uh, oriented. <laughs> So how much of this uh, first album will you be performing on the 50th anniversary show? Um, I think from memory about three or four tracks. But as you know, my catalogue is so vast now. Um, even a normal gig, well, I mean, I'm playing for about two hours on stage. And even that, it, it, trying to do the set list year after year, it gets harder and harder and harder. Um, you know, and there's some stuff. It, 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 and it's not just about commercial promotion. It, it's just, uh, you know, say the Nashville album, there was tracks on that I really wanted to do, but I, I had um, I had nine radio hits. If you include Get Back to the Shelter and Glory Road, which got quite good airplay, even though they weren't chart hits. So I almost start with a handicap of nine songs and I can do only fit 18 in. And so to get all these songs um, into one show is really something. Um, so for this year's State Theatre, it's the most challenging I've probably ever done um, because, yeah, I, so I've got Throwing Down a Line from the um, Girls in the Avenue album and I've got Stepping Across the Line from Main Street Drive. In other words, I'm trying to uh, touch bases with as many of my old albums as I can, but it's just impossible. You know, with, I play for three hours, but three hours is nowhere near enough. Didn't I tell you about that, that time... Um, the promoter wanted to do um, Richard Clapton by request, and he he sent out a, a sort of database thing, and we got thousands of responses, and and so the way these shows, uh, you know, the Palais will be the same show where, where I start out, I'll do about six acoustic songs, um, like Walk on Water and Blue Bay Blues, etc., and end up with Winter Time in Amsterdam. You have an intermission, I come back, and in the in the first. Uh, this particular year, in, in the first um, whatever the acoustic set is, about 40 minutes, there are all these people, um, which probably friends of yours, Paul, yelling out for dark spaces. And I kept going, <laughs> yes, okay, okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> and so intermission is a mandatory 25 minutes at the state and I think at the Palais as well. I think it's 25 minutes. I came back and I said, look, um, all you dark spaces aficionados, I got my calculator out. And I estimated that I'm pretty sure I have 264 registered songs that I've recorded with APRA. And I worked out, say on an average four or five minutes, I worked it out, and it would take me about 1.9 days 
and 2,000 people go, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beauty, kill me. <laughs> yeah, I can play for two days nonstop. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you probably just fall down at the end of that, but uh, yeah. Give it a try. yeah. Yeah. There's some great players on uh, Prussian Blue. Russell Dunlop, Kevin Borich was on that record, mm. uh, but also Red McKelvey, um, who we yeah. lost recently as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, what a great guitarist. And he, he was a guitarist on Girls on the Avenue, wasn't he? Red, I met on the first album on Prussian Blue. Um, because Red played on Last Train to Marseille, actually. Yeah. And Red and I hit it off immediately. Um, because Red was a feisty, he was a skinny little guy, and he was a feisty little, um, how shall I put it, left left winger. And me just coming from Berlin, I was a feisty left winger. I, I, Red always used because the money they were getting paid was shit, you know. And Red used to grumble, and he, he had the big droopy moustache with beer foam on his. Mate, mate, all I'm trying, all I'm trying to say, digger, you know, fair days work, fair days dollar, digger, you know, is it, you know. And uh, that was Med's, Red's mantra, fair day's work for a fair day's dollar, mm. which I reckon, yeah, is true. So Red and I just had this affinity um, personally, and he, he was a hard taskmaster. I mean, I, we'd get other musicians in, and Red and I formed a couple of bands, and he'd keep sacking and anyone who wasn't pulling their weight. He'd sack them on the spot sort of thing. Um, but, gee, you know, so... All right, Red McKelvey played with me 50 years ago. And nowadays I bump into young guys, like young guys in their 20s who just go, gee, man, who the hell is that? You know, and, and trying to explain to all these young guys about Red McKelvey, Kirk Orange, you know, Ben Butler, nowadays Danny Spencer and all, all these amazing, you know, Karen Tolhurst, all these amazing players that I've, um, played with over the years, and I, I, I don't know. I've just been blessed. Don't they call it kissed on the? You know, <laughs> you finished the sentence. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, ha it has been a, a tough couple of years. Uh, you know, losing Red, uh, but also Doug Mulray in the last week. Yeah. He was a pretty good friend of yours. I know, but but see, I, I mean, you know, we won't dwell on this, but you've been talking about Prussian Blue, and I, when I was trying to put the State Theatre set together, um, I thought, well, I've got to do Survivor. And that was the Lardy Dars. Now, you tell me, Kevin's the only one left, isn't he, in, in, from the Lardy Dars? I, I, I would have to. Kevin Boric. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, well, Keith Barber, didn't Keith Barber pass away? I don't oh. know the bass player did. Mm-hmm. So recently, I, I even think about all my, well, I'll call them comrades that I've grown up with. And, you know, I, I just try to imagine what it would be like to be in a band when, you know, when your bandmates are falling off the perch. And um, I don't know, that must be a pretty desolate kind of feeling, mm. I reckon. Yeah. Anyway, moving right along. Up five. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, like your your days with Doug went way back before. Uh, you know, a lot of us got to know him on Triple M and uh, Sydney Radio. My my days with Doug started with Double J, as I recall. Oh. Um, and I think it was Doug that introduced me to the whole um, Double J culture. God, what a different yeah. culture that was. <laughs> and, I mean, and you survived that. <laughs> oh, I survived that, but, you know, I had this Double J. Today. That ain't double J. It's like Warners today. That ain't Warners, mate. <laughs> uh, read my book. It's all there. Um, but yeah, and I mean, so many, you know, so many great experiences from, from um, uh, yeah, becoming part of that original double J culture. Um, and I think you remember stories I've told. Well, not stories, it's all true about how George Wayne, when he returned from 10 years in LA, and he, you know, he knew Lyle George and, and Jackson Brown and, and George came back here and got on Double J and he was introducing Jackson Brown, Lyle George, Bob Dylan, all, all of these gods, really. Um, and mainly the, the Goodbye Tiger album. George just thought that was the his pants. Hmm. So, um, yeah, they were really happy years. And, and then I sort of seamlessly, I suppose, almost followed Doug into the, into the um, Triple M, the world of wonderful world of Triple M. Hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean... You know, I met Rod Muir almost at the start, 
And Rod, I think it was after backstage in excess gig, I think. And Rod came up and he's, he was, you know, um, sort of ranting at me like, mate, mate, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you are the contemporary banjo Patterson and people shouldn't blah, 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 blah. And so Rod and I, you know, that, that's, that was the start of a beautiful friendship for many years mm. with, with Rod and Kathy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and obviously, uh, it, yeah, it is very sad because, you know, these are people, like Doug had this, this really great farm at Bilpin on um, sort of up in the, the mountains oh, outside of Sydney. It's a hard telling Victorian where Bilpin is, but anyway... And we spent, you know, when my children were growing up, see, I mean, my daughters now, they've just turned 33 and they remember Doug and they remember these really happy times because we used to regularly go up to his farm in Bilpin and just hang out and, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure I um, I won't rave on about his place. At, uh, oh, jeez, help me out here, Paul. You know, up above DY. Oh, God, I really do have brain fog. But, <laughs> but he had... Had an amazing house up there as well. Mm. And he had a helipad at his house. And, um, oh, God, it was up there. You go up the hill from DY. If you're from <laughs> Melbourne, I can't help you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> from Melbourne or any other place on the planet. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, House of Orange was uh, 2016. Uh, we haven't had an album of new Richard Clapton songs since then. So I would mm. imagine there must be an entire album of Richard Clapton songs in your head at the moment? Um, it would be in my head. To be honest, COVID didn't do me much good creatively. Um, and I've been finding, talking to a lot of uh, my contemporaries, there's something about COVID, it, it can't, it's, it's a bit numbing. And I, I, I don't know whether it's because it, it's such a weird situation that we've never experienced in our lifetimes. But, but it, it kind of, I don't know, with me, it sort of made me a bit brain dead. I just seem to be going from day one day to the next. Hmm. Um, so, it, and it's, it, you know, I've got a really great doctor who really um, finds this quite worrying, you know, that I haven't been writing as much as I should um, and because my doctor thinks that the reason <laughs> I'm just still here and going on for so long is just the catharsis of being a songwriter. And I mean, if you, if you think about it in in your um, chosen role in life, you know, you, I mean, I know David Crosby just passed away, but he was eighty one. Mm. I mean, it's pretty good innings for somebody that took that many drugs. God. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So it it is. Look, it weighs on my mind, Paul. And um, I I look. I, I know. I know how it works. I have had droughts before, but nothing like this long. This has been, you know get on for a couple of years and I'm, I, I always write lyrics though I always have lyrics but it's just that um I think ever since I met in excess and and started being so creative with Johnny Farris I got into the habit of more instead of just writing lyrics like poetry um you know because I was living with Johnny for a lot of the 80s and he just got me into all it he, he just introduced me to rhythm quite frankly mm. and that that point and when I started working with NXS is when I, I don't know, I wanted to meld the two art forms together, the lyrics and, and the music and do both at the same time. Mm. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say write, lyrically write a verse and then immediately put that to music and then the building blocks go on from there, but musically, not just lyrically. Yeah. So two shows coming up, 15th of April in Sydney and 19th of May in Melbourne. Yep. And... um Man, what can I say? It's, it's, this be there is or be square, I think is. Uh, be there or be square. Is radio, yeah. And yeah, come to the part that never ends because I ain't in it yet, and I don't have no intention of. Um, and this is just it, it's because this is. Um, I mean, the promoter took me away from the state theatre for a couple of years because it got too expensive, and put me in the Enmore, which was great. I love the Enmore as well, but in total, this is about fifteen years I've been doing this now. Hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's a great ride, and it ain't over yet. Famous last words. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I thought I just said up vibe, and you got to come out with 
I said no past tense, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paul, it's been a really good ride, but <laughs> it's all over now. <laughs> no, it ain't. <laughs> I'm going to hang around like a like a stinker. <laughs> right. Oh, you're recording that, are you? No, My input, please. <laughs> Good to see you, Richard. Same here, Paul. Thanks a lot, mate.